You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Pneumonia. A typical, let's say, bacterial pneumonia would, would typically affect, you know, one part of the lung, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, one lobe of the lung. And again, as you can see in the video, it not only affects both lungs, but affects various parts of each lung. So it's pretty diffuse damage. Um, and the other thing, the caveat in all this too, is that the, cap the, the images that you are looking at, the video that you're looking at, mm -hmm. is based on the CAT scan that was performed before he got so sick that he had to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. So if you were to repeat that CAT scan, perhaps 48 hours later, yeah. chances are you're gonna be seeing much more yellow than you actually are, that things would be even worse. About halfway through the video, we do what's called a, a virtual bronchoscopy, where now you get, kind of get the bird's eye view and you start going into the trachea, into the major airway, and then you go down into the right lung. And now that you're actually inside the right lung and kind of seeing some of those yellow areas, uh, you know, up close and personal. This was a 59-year-old gentleman with who did not have, you know, you hear a lot about, you know, this, this only affects elderly patients or somebody who's got lots of other medical problems or is immunosuppressed. And the more and more we learn about, um, you know, our experience here in the U.S., the more we know that that's not true. Uh, we, we know that, you know, the elderly immunosuppressed patients with a lot of medical problems are more severely affected, but the disease is not limited to them. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, this is Mike Bolzer of uh, All Things 3D, and this is a special 3D in review about COVID-19, and we're going to talk about 3D fabrication, 3D scanning, 3D design. As you can see behind me is some videos done from Surgical Theater of using CT scans to actually look at uh, the effects of the COVID-19 within the lung system. And this is actually a person that was... Uh, diagnosed and is now in ICU. So I'm going to take off this mask that I created. We're going to talk about that later so that you can hear me properly. And uh, so I'll just go ahead and let this continue to play. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of things to cover today. Uh, some of you might be interested in the actual 3D fabrication component. Some of you may actually be interested in actually creating your own sterilizing unit using UVC lamps. And we're going to go through this whole process. Um, I, I must uh, put a disclaimer here that whatever I discuss here is not medically licensed. It is from my own experience as a 3D fabricator designer. And uh, from that perspective, some things that I have seen over the period of time. Uh, in my own experience, uh, some of you who have followed me over the years have probably uh, known that uh, I've done some things like 3D fabricate my wife's skull. Uh, and send it to her surgeon that kind of went viral and we did a TEDx talk on. So I've been doing this a little bit and a little bit later I'm gonna provide uh, in the show notes that you can come back to if you uh, don't have time to watch this all the way through. I'll try to create links so that uh, you can essentially work with uh, wherever you want to in this particular video. So I'll put little segment uh, identifiers in it uh, so that you can work with that. And let's see what else. Um, well, I think we should just go ahead and get started. So the video that you saw behind me, um, which I'm going to jump in right now. Uh, actually, I don't have it, uh, but we'll get into it. It's done by a company uh, that specializes in uh, doing these type of animated videos. And in fact, I have one more video that I guess I can get into in a second. Um, but uh, I'll hold off on that and we'll get into this here. Um, one of the things that we're doing uh, with CT scanning or tomographies is creating a database for, uh, obviously, uh, the term is neural networks or AI to help in the diagnosis. Uh, this is uh, so something that was started in China uh, to help in rural areas there uh, where you didn't have the ex expert radiologist there to determine this. And it also supposedly improves it. So why would you do this when you have a test? Well, obviously, uh, if you're, you're going to use a tier system of diagnosis, um, 
having to be able to determine early on without actually having to do, uh, do the test was important. In uh, China, they actually had set up multiple CT scanners along with uh, taking temperature readings uh, before getting to the test itself. And so it's an alternative, uh, especially in areas where testing is going to be very difficult uh, uh, using the swab and this may uh, actually help in uh, that particular case. And so this article here, again, will be in the show notes, talks about this. But the main thing, if you noticed in the title, was not uh, essentially how it's being utilized, but the lack of data um, that's available in order to create the, the large database required in order to do um, the AI, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, confidence checking. and. So that's a problem here, um, having enough information. So if you're working for a hospital or know of somebody who's doing this, uh, we should probably make this more of a global thing and allow this data to, to be accumulated uh, to provide faster diagnosis. And so we'll move on to the next item. And I'm just going to run through these really quick here. Uh, this is going to stick with the more of the visualization at this particular point and the using of CT scanners to create tomographies. Uh, I had in previous, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, episodes, uh, talked with uh, a leading radiologist from Florida, uh, Dr. Cleoz, that uh, if you may have followed my show in the past, and again this is in the 3D and medicine uh, playlist that I will have in the show notes as well, uh, that uh, when I wanted to share my own DICOM, I used a product called Image32, which doesn't exist anymore. Why? Because Citrix bought them out. They've added it as part of their share file, but now you have the ability with their, uh, let's see, we can actually, uh, let's see, I think it's down here later. Uh, there is a feature now, if you sign up, there's a free account as well as for businesses um, that now allows you uh, with HIPAA compliance to upload DICOMs and share them with your physician and others, or your physicians can use it as well. Um, I was very intrigued by it. Now this is basically 2D uh, image uh, presentation. It is not 3D. When I had discussed it with the company at the time, they said they had been working on it. Uh, clearly, I don't think that's still the case. So let's kind of move into the next thing. If you want to 3D visualize, uh, just like you saw in that video, there are several uh, now free um, DICOM viewers, and one of them that jumped out at me uh, was this one right here, uh, the Radiant, uh, which gives you the ability during 3D, and then this Pro Surgical 3D, which um, I guess you can only receive through invitation, and then 3D Viewer, and uh, as you can see, I'll, I'll, there's quite a few here. And some of them provide uh, three, uh, 3D volume creation, and some of them don't. Uh, so you'll have to look into that. And then some of them have the ability to actually create. Now, what they don't show here is one that I've used over the years, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. And it's a free open source tool used a lot by researchers. And if you go back into some of my own videos, I actually give a tutorial. In fact, I'll jump to it now. Um, this is my own playlist, uh, starting off with the TEDx I did in Madrid, Spain. But if you go down, um, there's quite a few, but there's one in particular that I actually worked with a, a radiologist resident uh, who asked me later on to not identify where he was from. So let me see where it's at. Yeah, learn to turn your CAT or CT MR scan into a 3D model. Uh, grab that one. It's really informative. Uh, probably more because I had an actual uh, radiologist residence and also all the ones with Dr. Cleo's uh, are very important as well. Uh, so go ahead and take a look at them. And, you know, I kind of missed it. Um, ah, geez, where did it go? Let's see if I can find it real quick. Hmm, I don't know how. I, well, I'll get back to it. There was a cool little video um, from the company who created that 3D visualization software um, of the, the lungs that is actually using this for VR usage. Um, I'll get to that a, a little bit later. Uh, but something else that I wanted to bring up 
is uh, this iconic image behind me, and you may have seen it in a lot of presentations, but uh, the, the really fun, or not fun, obviously, uh, what makes it so dramatic is its coloring. Uh, this is a great article from the New York Times uh, that ha uh, did an interview uh, with Alyssa Eckert, one of the medical illustrators who actually created this, 3D modeled it, and uh, you know I've been trying to look for the actual model, which I can't find, but uh, if you're familiar with Sketchfab, let me put this here, Sketchfab as well as um, uh, a few of the others out there that provide 3D models, you can find some of the models, just do a COVID-19 search. And uh, here's about, uh, this is a neat little model uh, that I actually uh, used. If you're not familiar with Sketchfab, uh, not only does it have a VR component, obviously it has a web browser component that you can move models around, and also an AR component, which allows me to do this little uh, I don't know if you want to call it a little fun video uh, where I floated it above my my sterilization jar that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so that's built into Sketchfab. However, Sketchfab has gone a little bit further in creating a repository where you can sell your 3D models. So a lot of them are available. For eight bucks, you can buy this neat model and uh, download it and it tells you what it's compatible with and the important thing is that it's it also seems to be very AR friendly so if you wanted to create which I plan to do one that uh, can be uploaded as a use USDZ for Apple so anybody with an iPhone uh, can essentially use the AR functionality of the viewer and put it in your space and walk around it and observe it uh, some interesting aspects to this and from that, let's get into a little more technical. This is something that just came out too from Target Review, uh, which is a more elaborate, and I've also um, requested a model of this one, more elaborate model, uh, actually based upon some other um, information and from, for instance, the spikes, the envelope, and the membrane in order to create it. Uh, there's a little video here. But one of the things that I read that uh, seems to be really interesting about this particular uh, virus is the number of, as my wife some spikes or uh, what do you want to call it? nodes uh, that extend from this being more than other uh, viruses. Uh, and what that makes it is very sticky. So this is the, one of the reasons why it's so contagious. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, but more information here. Uh, you can go out to the actual website that created it and then find their contact information. So if you're into research or so forth and want more information on it, it is available to you out there. So let's see what else. So that, uh, okay, so here's the Fusion Medical Animation. They're the ones that created that previous video of the lungs. And they've got several out here. Actually, I'm sorry, they created this um, previous um, COVID-19 virus molecule that you see here. Okay, so the moving on to this, um, let's get into the actual creation of mask and other medical devices. And in my research over the last couple of days, I found that there's a lot of extremely interesting information. Uh, one thing that I wasn't aware of is how much the FDA has embraced uh, 3D fabrication. Now it's been several years, as you know, I've kind of moved into more virtual reality and working on another project, uh, but coming back to it because of the COVID-19, uh, I'm not necessarily surprised, but pleased um, to see that there's more embracement by the government. At the time that I had 3D fabricated uh, my wife's skull, um, it was fairly new and medical um, hospitals and so forth were just embracing it. Um, now we're seeing the FDA, especially now during the COVID, creating somewhat of a fast track. Um, so they've got a page set up, um, facts on 3D printing medical devices. And again, I'm not going to read this verbatim. You can do that. Um, but it has a questions and answer. Uh, so if you're interested, if you've got a unique design, it basically goes question by question on what you can do in order to create it. And, um, and then there's a page, which I thought was kind of neat. 
move on to this one. Not that one, let me find the page. Well, I'll get to it a little bit later, um, but there's a page that actually has a full listing of all of these uh, that have been submitted to the FDA that you could download and print right now. Um, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So here's a page to start with. And then uh, obviously uh, the USDA is also involved with it. Here's a small blog article uh, from the rural development perspective uh, in Kentucky using 3D printers in order to print the face mask bands you may have seen. And we're gonna go through a, a few sites that if you wanted to do this, there are a ton of models uh, that are, are coming up right now. But again, remember, none of these have been actually sanctioned or verified or um, verified by the, uh, the FDA. So there's probably stipulations and exclaimers that identify or disclaimers that they're not to be used with uh, from the medical perspective. But today, if you're looking to create a mask because they're either difficult to obtain uh, you may have seen some videos showing how to use scarves, and we're going to go into how to actually, if you've got a 3D printer, if you've got a friend, how to make one yourself. And, and if you notice, when I started this show, I actually fabricated mine from a design, I think, from Brazil. Um, it had a little bit of controversy, plus a little difficult to build, and uh, we're going to kind of go into what I did in order to make it a little bit more comfortable and the seal more secure and then how this particular one works, and then what I have thought might be a better choice, and obviously others have thought so as well, reducing the amount of plastic, because if you're a 3D fabricator or you're familiar with it, the more plastic and layers you have to print, the more time it takes. And so by printing a full um, face mask like this or some of these other designs, it's going to take a while. In fact, this was two and a half hours. So you're not going to make a lot of these if you're trying to reproduce these in quick volume. And as I've mentioned on my show in the past, you know, 3D fabrication should not be the end all. And you should use this along with other maker skills, like maybe create some of the plastic components, but use some other skills along with it um, that we're going to get into. Okay, so let's kind of move on a little bit. From a government perspective, uh, or I'm sorry, from the 3D printing industry, uh, I'm going to look at some of the leaders like Stratasys and 3D Systems and go out to their pages and see how they're uh, going ahead and introducing themselves and what they're doing to help. And I thought it's pretty cool that uh, a lot of them are pitching into uh, or providing uh, either resources or information. Or in, as well as contact information on how to utilize their systems uh, to help in the COVID-19 um, fabrication process. Uh, so this one here is kind of an overall article identifying how they're moving into it. Uh, one company I didn't uh, look into was Form Labs, but as you know, Form Labs has really moved more into the dental and medical area with some of their formulations. So I'll probably bring that up a little bit later, but I'll start with Stratasys. So they've got a page basically identifying how many face shields are required. And then a gallery of images of what Stratasys has been printing. And then further news coverage, um, HP makes a fine printer, uh, a lot of uh, uh, your larger, uh, what do you want to call it, design or fabrication studios, as well as uh, a lot of medical uh, locations use HP 3D printers now. So here they show a 3D printer that you can actually download. Uh, so they have multiple things uh, that were designed. Here's another face shield, the Budman face shield, uh, stopgap face mask, and as you can tell, all these you can download the files for. Risk cover uh, explains why this would be important. Uh, I thought this was kind of hands-free 3D printed door openers so that you don't actually have to touch the handle. Um, not only do they show the, or have the file for the one that's displayed here, but they have several uh, large, small, different variety, personal door opener, 
mask adjuster. This is becoming very popular. Uh, if you've ever worked with some of these masks that go over your ears, it can be very uncomfortable. So this is a unique solution uh, to minimize the discomfort of the mask. Uh, and there are several like this. And then uh, from a half mask component, building a component so you can put filters on it, a field respirator. So HP obviously has done a bang up job of not only providing information, but files to work with. Uh, Materialize is also providing a response. And again, the 3D uh, handles and other solutions. And then here you actually have some instructions and Materialize was actually the one that HP listed. Look at all the different types that you could uh, get the files for and start printing. And they also include the actual design files. Uh, so if you wanted to make some modifications to it in some uh, CAD program like SolidWorks or Fusion 360, uh, you can go ahead and work with them there. OK, so uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, this was another about creating a mechanical ventilator and then talks about the challenge of doing so. And all these links that I'm going through really quick will be in the show notes so that uh, you'll be able, in fact, YouTube does a good job of making them linkable. So you can just click on them and go to these pages yourself. Um, grab, uh, excuse me, GrabCAD, if you're already a designer, you're already familiar with this, GrabCAD, there is this thing called the COVID-19 challenge. This is round one. There were entries, there were 17 entries into it. And uh, here are the particular components. And as you can see here, some of them are fairly sophisticated. Some of them are not as sophisticated, um, but can basically using 3D printer components like these two here, uh, provide the pumping action that's required and using uh, essentially, um, I don't know what they're using here uh, for their rear end, but if you click on it, it should bring up the information for this particular project and the tools. And this particular person says they're not much of a programmer and would be um, thankful if somebody would come along and give them a hand with it. So I'm thinking, does it say what they're using? I think you can go out further. I wanted to say that they're using a Raspberry Pi uh, with a display unit, but uh, I could be wrong. Obviously, you can go out and find more information on it. Could actually even be a, a let's see, a fabrication board. So there's a Obviously, quite a few particular designs here. Uh, some of them, as this particular case, the Frax 3D is actually moved into a working prototype. Some of these are still um, CAD files with just renderings. And uh, so this is the ones that are right now up for round one in the COVID-19 challenge. And then Grab CAD themselves, if you do a search for COVID-19, it'll give you a list of a lot of the components that are available, not only as STLs, which are used to provide 3D print files, but also uh, the actual design files. So if you wanted to make modifications or just see how this person has designed this uh, as maybe a start of your own, uh, you can go ahead. For instance, like this face shield version two. If you download the file, it comes in as, um, let's see, what does it come in as? I'd have to unzip it. So we'll go ahead and do that. So a SOLIDWORKS file, DXF. Uh, so more than likely you should be able to bring this, any of these particular files directly into your CAD software and work with it. Obviously if you're a SOLIDWORKS user, 
Uh, it's very easy to import many of them. Uh, uh, a lot of them use the step file format. In fact, down here it tells you, like this was an STL. This one here is both a step and IGIS file. And then this one here just shows it as an, as an STL rendering. So, uh, yeah, and, but you can obviously download the STL file for it. So again, some of them are just the 3D print files. Some of them are actually the design files that you can further modify. And there are, I wouldn't say a ton, but there are obviously plenty of inventive people out there who are creating interesting and unique devices. So this one's kind of interesting. This is what I'm, I'm looking towards um, creating. And this one's kind of neat in kind of the direction I was going. I was going to add two um, frame components to it, but literally it's just a rim. And the important thing that I have discovered, um, which I'm going to get more into when I get into the tech closet, is these full face versions just take an hour to two hours to print, where this here will take about 15 minutes. And then by using standard um, filtering material, um, it allows it to be supported um, with some rigidity that you can't have. Now, the other thing is if you print this in PLL or PLA, you can soften it either by putting your uh, oven at a very low temperature or even hot water and then softening the material, putting up to your face to conform it. In fact, I'll tell you about the story with my own mask here. And then it will hold that shape once it um, uh, cools down and then it's made specifically your face. And anybody can do this as long as you have hot water. So again, really nice design. And as you can see here, they've got these little loops off to the side here uh, for the rubber bands. And uh, you may print this plus that little 3D print um, piece for the back of your head and you've got a very comfortable solution. And then uh, if we take that and like I've got these tea bags here, plus I have um, some industrial towels and I'm going to go through a little um, image sheet a little bit later on the different qualities of materials to use if you're trying to design this. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that this can be open and I can add sheets into it. And then I just basically place it over my head, put the frame over the top of it, and I have a mask. And obviously you could use hot glue to glue it in place or just put it on your face or and then put that on. Now there's another design out there that's basically plastic clamps off to the side. Um, so there's a lot of quick easy to work with methods um, that essentially use good materials and just firmly put it in place to create a airtight seal. And that's the most important thing. And there's a lot of other videos you may have seen out there using aerosols to determine, you know, the, uh, what do you want to call it? The ability to resist um, aerosol fluids from coming through. And some of them are, are pretty convincing that some of these materials aren't very good. So I thought that, that that's a neat design. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and design it. So there are plenty out there. Uh, it's up to you. Um, and I'll just go through a little bit later on what I feel uh, is important. And you just basically have to sign up for an account. And uh, lots of design out, designs out there uh, to work with. OK, so let's move on to the next one, air factories. What I thought was interesting about this is that um, Air Factories also develops uh, you know, this particular component here. But what else did I see? Here we go. Uh, the different splitting of the valves. If you have been reading the news, uh, news, the, the news lately, uh, one of the issues is there's not enough ventilators. And without enough ventilators, you have to come up with obviously interesting solutions. And one of the ways is to split it so that you can put um, the ventilation pro or air and split it off into multiple. Now, from what I've read, that can be a very difficult process to regulate. Um, and more importantly, having the components uh, that are available. So this particular company um, has actually created some models uh, that I'm pretty sure that you can download and fabricate yourself. So that's something to look at uh, as well. So if you're a 3D printer, you're probably familiar with these sites here that I'm going to get into now. But Thingiverse would be 
one, and I kind of like this one. These are those little clamps that I was talking about. Um, but Thingiverse, if you do a search as well to, for COVID-19, you can look at uh, a lot of the designs made by makers. And it's taken a while for the images to come up. There we go. And as you can see here, a lot of the mask. <laughs> This nano hack that you see right here is the one that I created. Um, and I'm going to go into some concerns about this. I would not recommend it. In fact, the person who created this, there's kind of a controversy, and we're going to get into it in that in a moment. Um, here's another mask. But you can see there are several masks. Now, the problem with these masks, as you can see here, is the amount of time it takes to print them but also how well do they conform to your face. Now, if you print these in a PLA uh, material, uh, you can soften them and then conform them. But some people are concerned that PLA in some of these materials uh, may not hold up, which is possible. And uh, also because they're FDM, if you don't print the, uh, what do you want to call it, the <coughs> the exclusion process thick enough that you could have weak areas between each of the, the filament strands uh, unless you do a cross section and I would say basically do a hundred percent infill to re reduce that um, problem and uh, so that's a point and then obviously if your layers aren't completely uh, blending or melding with the previous layers um, they can essentially pull away from it and create some deterioration um, and then also the different types of materials you need to be concerned with um, you know, some people recommend nylon and then I read an article and I don't know if I have it here but you'll find out that nylon may have some concerns as well so it's very important not only to be able to reproduce the mass but ensure that you're not actually causing more problems for yourself and the type of material you're working with um, but Thingiverse is more, I wouldn't say amateur, um, but more of the maker community instead of more professional designers. Uh, but as you can see, it's a good starting point. The other thing is they normally only provide the print files or the STL files. Um, so if you wanted to go back and redesign a component in your CAD software, it's much more difficult to do here than using GrabCAD. Another one that is more universal from an international perspective and also started by uh, Jeez, now I've already forgotten the name of the company. Um, but one of the other major manufacturers of um, 3D printers uh, created this website called Umagine. And uh, they have also their variations of masks as well as frames for uh, the shields that are in demand right now. So you can go ahead and like browse more featured designs. Ultimaker, that's what I was thinking of which is still in business. They make some great printers. Um, I uh, had talked to some of the founders way back when they were just getting started in 2013, 2014. Um, clearly, they're one of the, the big names. And uh, let's bring up, well, I said I was going to bring up Form Labs, so I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. If I can type properly. Let's see what they're doing. Uh, so that's interesting. So they're actually um, printing out the swabs. So as mentioned already, they, uh, and oh, look at this, different things that are being fabricated. So as mentioned, they have put out a lot of materials now and if you're not familiar with form labs or the type of printing it's called SLA and essentially they use a ultraviolet wavelength laser in order to harden um, a material that is kind of viscous and into a hard device and I had one of the first unit ones and what they're known for is the resolution or the quality of the components that can be created from this but they're also known for at least the earlier versions 
um, being fairly, fairly slow. Um, as you can see here, the volume has allowed them to fabricate, obviously, I don't know how many are there, it looks like about a hundred of these uh, particular swab tubes. And the materials they have now are FDA approved. Uh, they're being used in dentistry and other things. Uh, in fact, if we went to the materials here, like I said, um, there's the dental right here. And, uh, but keep in mind, some of these materials I highly recommend not to use, especially uh, for any extended period on your skin. In fact, one of the notes when we were using this is essentially keep it away from your skin because it may irritate you. Um, so not all the materials used here are, are useful from that perspective. Uh, which gets to another point that we'll talk about a little bit later is, you know, you don't necessarily have to create the finished product here. You can make a mold, meaning the negative formation, and then pouring materials into it. And there are a lot of different solutions out there where they're doing this, or jigs um, where you can essentially put a pliable material that's been heated over it and form it over the, the jig that you're working with. So you can use your 3D printer to print the jigs or the molds uh, in order to mass produce using standard techniques. And uh, that's something people are using as well right now. Okay, so let's go into the cleaning process. Uh, now that we've looked at fabricating, but I did mention, so let me go back to my main screen here, what uh, I talk about my mask here. So like I said, uh, let's see if I can bring it back up again. Do a little search. There we go. The company is called Copper 3D, and there's been a little bit of a controversy that at least I've read about. One thing Copper 3D makes filament. Why are they called copper? Because they obviously indicate that they introduce copper into their filament. As you're probably aware, if you've been 3D printing, you can add materials to your filament. Uh, for instance, they use, uh, oh, no, I can't think of the word, uh, different things um, in order to um, strengthen them. Uh, carbon fiber, you may have heard of. But here they say they're using copper. And if you read other articles, copper has interesting properties uh, that makes it. Uh, Kind of harmful for viruses and uh, so there's been a lot of talk now they basically have hyped up their particular use for it and using the copper but some people think there's not enough copper in their filament and also the fact is if you remember they came out with one of the first masks which they no longer have up but they have this new one now um, and identifying the only thing that makes this um, viable is to use only their uh, filament. So clearly it was kind of a slide in order to kind of push the person, if you're going to make this mask, you can only use our PLA material um, with the copper component to it. Uh, and some people think it's no better than other PLA materials. In fact, my uh, favorite over the years has been Polymax. And because one, it seems to have better strength uh, and also flexibility than other forms of PLA out there. In fact, I was printing with an old, I wanted to make a, kind of a translucent, which as you can see is around the edge here, uh, underneath the Unreal logo, uh, and just had a real terrible time. Went back to my Polymax to create black, and it actually looks kind of cool, and obviously added a few labels to it. Uh, kind of looks like a stock car version of a mask. but. It comes out as a flat design. And let's see if I can bring up the Nano Hack. Let's see, here it is. So when this thing is printed, yep, let me bring back the screen. Okay, it might take a little bit. But so when this thing is printed, it's basically just a flat design. Um, and from there, you have to literally warm it up using hot water, hair dryer, or even 
put it back on the bed of your 3D printer at about 50 degrees centigrade or something like that, just to soften it up. And then once you do that, then you put it up against your face as a flat iron and kind of mold it. And I found that doing it all at once is a problem because this lower component here, let me bring up the other screen again, this, this lower portion is separated. In fact, I had to use super glue to glue it in place, and then I have some super 3M tape that I sealed that particular um, ridge right there. And uh, from there, I kind of created a mask, but then had to conform it to my face. Here we go. And uh, let me jump back to it. So this is how it prints. And here's a model. In fact, sometimes... So here's the model itself, and this particular portion here took about an hour and a half to print. It's not very thick, I'd say. I don't have my uh, micrometer here, but uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe one, two, two to five millimeters. No, that's not less than that, about one millimeter. Uh, of thickness in material, and then uh, a surface here that has uh, where you put your filter material in, and it also has um, threads so that you can put in the cap. Uh, there are two other components that are printed with it uh, this filter piece, and then the cap itself, which they don't seem to have listed. Let's go back to this one, this piece here, and uh, let me jump back to well, I will stay here. Uh, you can, if you print it properly, and I did notice there was a lot of extra thread, um, you pull that out, and I essentially just used, I think I had an old mask, I just took the material out from that. Um, they say, and I'll bring it up in a little bit, but here's the, oops, there you go, the other piece, and let me go back to my screen here. Um, so here's the pieces that I had printed, all three pieces but this is this is the only breathable area and the sad fact is this is made out of plastic and unless you conform it very well to your face there's going to be leakage around the edges so what I did and I let's see if you can see it here I have some neoprene perforated foam that I had been using to design my VR headsets that I basically cut out a piece based upon the earlier flat design and then cut out a piece around where the uh, vent is so that way not only is it more comfortable uh, but it's more snug and has a tighter fit and then finally if you notice it um, going back to the design it has little areas here to basically put an elastic band could be rubber bands I had an old elastic band uh, from one of my, I don't know what it's from, some type of headset. So it worked out well because it's got a little clips, so I can essentially put it around my head like this and then attach it onto the other side and then voila. And then you adjust the band in the back of your head like that. And there you go. And again, if it's formed properly, the only area you should be able to get air out of is right here. In fact, I have my nose pinched pretty well that it doesn't even function. So I have to kind of breathe through my mouth. And then that's the only way that I get air into this. Um, so with the neoprene foam, and I think it's I'm using a quarter inch or maybe even a little less than that. I don't know exactly. Um, it provides a very tight, um, firm fitting. And as you can see, I also sound like Darth Vader, so that's a big plus out of it, too. So the problem is it's a flat design and it has to be molded like, and they identify like origami. If you notice their new design, uh, let's see if I can go back to it. There we go. Is a whole different shape, uh, more like a mask. And again, because it, even though it seems to conform better like the regular 3M mask, which we're going to get into in a second. And I have one in front of me. I still have one. Because when I was 3D fabricating, and most of you out there who fabricate, um, know that parti particles, 
uh, from your 3D fabric or get into the air. And if you're printing with ABS or nylon, they can not only irritate, but after a while, the particle buildup can be a problem. So you need to both have good ventilation when you're 3D printing. And I was actually using masks a lot. And since I also did a lot of aerosol spraying of paint and so forth in order to beautify my models, uh, I got a couple of these and then finally got a full um, ventilated um, mask. But this is an N95 3M mask. This is the one that everybody's having. As you can see here, mine's kind of a little bit dirty. I've had it for several years. And so the thing that you're seeing in a lot of masks, and if you go back to Thingiverse, is that they, some people even actually scanned this component using a 3D scanner and then remodeled it. But again, it's this component here. And then you have this little vent here, which is it's a one-way vent to expel and then close off so that you don't breathe in. And then a metal band here to form around the nose. And then the two elastic bands here. Now, I don't know. And these actually seem to have a little bit of cloth on them. What I would recommend for the band, which I'll be testing, is you can get them on Amazon and other places, is go with silicone. It's a little bit more expensive. But I think, one, it works better, and especially if you're going to be sterilizing this, I found that standard rubber bands deteriorate very quickly, and unless you have a bunch of them, um, you're going to be going through them a lot. Silicone actually works out better. And the other advantage of silicone is that uh, if you use um, thermal-based sterilization, they survive better uh, than other forms. Um, your mask would probably burn up before the silicone does. Uh, in fact, I've got a lot of silicone baking things now that do very well about 400 degrees so Fahrenheit. Okay, so so what would you do in order to create this? This is one of the things is that I've noticed is that this particular mask here is kind of a, a thick material that essentially with the edge here is probably placed on a mold after being warm in order to conform to the facial structure then cooled and then creates this. So there really is no um, frame in here other than the material itself and then the uh, ridge on the edge. It's a fairly ele elegant design that a lot of people are trying to duplicate. Um, so that has been my goal as well and obviously other designers. This piece here is fairly easy to design and create. I don't know if it's important but it does allow you to expel air a little bit better than trying to blow. And the reason for that is that if you're expelling air, you're normally going to break the seals on the edges, and this allows that uh, pressure to be relieved uh, right here. So really wonderful design. And as mentioned, this is a compliant N95. <laughs> here are some cheap mats. I think I bought these on Amazon. Really inexpensive, but as you can see, the quality one, they're small, so a face like mine, they're not going to fit well, and so there could be a problem. And also, if I did an actual aerosol test on it, they probably would not actually work out well. So they're, they're, they give you a false sense of security. And then, as mentioned, I'm going to be using these tea bags with a, one of these shop towels. And I'm going to get in the different materials here in a second. And then either some brackets or a frame myself. And then basically seal it and then have a conform piece of plastic around the nose. And that should provide a very tight, low-cost solution. And so that will be coming next week. Uh, but that gives you a really good idea um, on building these things, a lot of different resources to work with. And if you've never 3D fabricated, getting into it now might be really frustrating. So what I would recommend is finding a friend um, or looking at all the YouTube tutorials, including my own, that my co-host uh, and friend Chris Kopak has helped me with over the years to get you started. Um, there are a lot of low-cost printers now. In the past, they were, gosh, fairly expensive. But now you can get them on Amazon. If you're familiar with Monoprice, they all have relatively inexpensive, underneath 500 some down to two to $300 that uh, just five years ago would have cost you two grand. Uh, so uh, the cost of printing has come down. Has the frustration level changed? I don't know. Um, it does. There's a learning curve, obviously, but clearly there are a lot of models available, some better than others. Uh, just look at their ratings and try it yourself. 
and create a few. And if you feel competent enough, create a few for your friends, your neighborhood, and uh, try and help out from that perspective. There are a lot of different groups out there that are soliciting uh, 3D fabricators. So if you've got somebody, uh, like some children, teenagers, who are bored the hell out of, I don't know how we'd say that, just bored, um, you can probably pick one of these up for less than $500, create a family project, and uh, build some masks or something. I've known several, written, as you probably have, lots of stories out there of children, uh, fourth grade and up, making masks, sewing masks. Uh, great projects. Keep the kids busy uh, while we're at stay-at-home orders and uh, helping the neighborhood and uh, the community. All right, let's move on to the other big thing that I've been working on, and that's my UV sterilization jar. And I, the reason this popped into my head is I had a whole bunch of UV light systems because, as mentioned, I printed in SLA, and sometimes even though the models um, were fairly formed and rigid, um, I you normally had to cure them a little longer, and so I created uh, a system that allowed me to essentially put in a ultraviolet light and radiate my models in order to cure them uh, to the fullest amount. And I have basically kind of a shoebox version, and I had bought a bunch of LEDs that I didn't use. And I said, well, that would be kind of neat. So I thought, well, I'd try them. But obviously with a lot of things, you should do some in, uh, research. And what I found is the UV lighting system that's great for curing plastics or fingernails. You may have had uh, fingernails painted and using a UV system. My wife has. Um, they use a different wavelength. So what I'd like to do now is go through a little bit of information on that end of the deal, and then we can go into where you can obtain the UV lights to create this. Now, if you notice, in the cap, I also have a UV. So the reason I did it, I created a serpentine with the LED. You may have seen these. It's like LED, um, kind of like a rope, but it's got adhesive on the back, into the canister itself, and then also on top. And one of the problems with UV um, irradiation is since it is a short wavelength, it only essentially kills on the surface. So if you have, uh, let's say, a mask that you place in there, it may not, it may have some areas of it that are, as they call, in shadow, and those will not get the same amount of light. So what I wanted to do is create a device um, that radiated not only from above, but from the sides, so essentially providing a full bath of UV, and also the more radiation that you have available to the object, the less time it's going to take to irritate it. And again, everything is based upon volume, and the longer it takes, the less you can do. And so if you've got hundreds of masks and you add five minutes to it, that's easy. 500 minutes, that's going to be a long time. Um, so any way you can reduce that. In fact, when I get done with this, it'll take less than 30 seconds to provide the irradiation pro um, that's required in order to uh, reduce the amount of, well, I wouldn't say virus load, but uh, both bacteria as well as virus. There's several things, but we'll get into that in a moment. So that was my goal here. Uh, the problem was my LED strips here is not the proper wavelength. So it looks cool. And I'm going to turn this on in a little bit, but uh, looks cool, but um, it really probably doesn't do much other than look cool. Now, the upper light is of the proper wavelength, um, but it is of a lower wattage, and I have some of these coming in, so I'm going to provide the sources that I've looked at and have worked with in the past. Uh, I, I'm not going to use the word sadly, but most of the, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? Vendors are from China, so I don't know what your feelings are, but to me, um, that's kind of the world we live in. There are very few manufacturing um, assembly in the United States or even worldwide. Most of uh, electronics is being manufactured in China. But uh, I don't know if I'll have the list, I'll at least have it in the show notes, of the different uh, LED manufacturers so that if you wanted to go to somebody else other than China, uh, you may do so. 
All right, so let's go back to some, let me get into some pages here. Okay, we'll start. Okay. We'll start with this article first. This is what I found on the CDC, and it basically talks about decontamination of reuse of filtering face piece, and this is the main reason that um, this type of technique has come to, uh, obviously, it's very important now because people are reusing masks instead of throwing them away, and so there's been information provided to CDC on how to best do that, and if you scroll through, it essentially gives you multiple ways to do this, and one of the things is that comes on this, is, excuse me, is on this list right up on top is ultraviolet, excuse me, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, or UVGI. And if you look at it, it seems like, wow, this is great. Essentially, you just irritate it with a light source, in this case UV, and you're done with it. But the important thing is this UV, or ultraviolet, is a particular wavelength. And we actually get into how this is done. Let's see, if, where does it show it? A little bit further down here. Here we go. <laughs> Tells you, and I don't know where this 0.5, but this is 950 microjoules at um, squared, which is the surface area, that this thing is required per centimeter. So that's not a lot, but more importantly, it's how close to the object that you can get. And if you provide something at this um, amount of radiation level, uh, and again, um, we're going to go to, I think I have it, a little article on how to actually figure out this. And it shows you the amount of the pass rate, number of cycles. And I think there is even more information down here. But some other techniques are also mentioned here, vapors, hydrogen peroxide which you may or may not have. Also, I think it would be a little bit more difficult to work with. Uh, and do they mention it here? There we go. They do not yet. There is a particular band of UV that you have to work with. And as I mentioned, I had a whole bunch of ultraviolet lights, but they're of the different, uh, improper wavelength. And what do I mean by wavelength? If you remember back in your physics class, uh, either back in grade school, high school, or college, light is built up of different wavelengths, uh, whereas red is a lower wavelength than, uh, um, let's see what, uh, I say lower, it's actually a larger number than blue or even UV. And I don't know if I have a little chart here that um, shows that. Maybe I can go out to and show you the color bands, but essentially the idea is that you want to go to a particular wavelength and that is what they found to be most successful in killing uh, the virus and actually several types. And let's see if I can move on. No, I won't go there yet. Um, but there are several types and there's a lot of references and one of these was very interesting because it talked about here we go, the guidelines, which is this one, and there was one other one here. Well, I won't go into that yet. I have another page that I'm going to bring up. But some of the uses that UV, and it's actually called UVC, which is the bandwidth or the uh, wavelength of this ultraviolet light. So this is important right now. Remember the term UVC because if you're looking for your own lights, um, anything that's not within this particular range, which is about 265 nanometers, uh, you want to stay away with, excuse me, stay away from. And here they show them, notice how it's kind of a light blue um, light, not necessarily purple. And these are tube based and they're fairly expensive, but what they do is they put these in inside the, um, the ambulance and they put them on for, I think, about 30 minutes. And uh, here they put this in a hospital bed. 
and they radiate the room. But again, remember, uh, they only radiate the surfaces that it can visibly see. It cannot radiate things around. Now notice how this person is using an aerosol cleaning system before actually doing it. So the big thing is don't just rely on the UVC. Also wipe things down like you normally would and this just helps ensuring that the surfaces are even more clean. And you may have, so I'm going to go to Forbes article here in a second. So good example, I also read an article that in China they're taking full buses, putting them into these garage areas and irritating them. I was thinking, you know, you could build these into airplanes so that at the end of a flight, you essentially turn this on for 30 minutes and uh, it would help irritate again the surface areas and then, you know, that's not going to again reduce the amount of standard cleaning. But again, with the price of these dropping, and which I guess would be one of the benefits of this pandemic is that we're seeing a lot of ingenuity being used in both manufacturing and the devices developed that uh, we'll probably all reap the benefits of as we go longer. And more importantly, maybe learn better ways of um, reducing the amount of virus and bacteria in our lives. Okay, so let's move on to this article. And this is, you may have seen these devices, like this one is a wireless UV smartphone cleaner. But what I noticed was the pricing, $100. This one here is 110 and the, the problem is, do they actually have enough energy uh, and how close would you need to use them and how far from the object and how much time and do they actually work? And a lot of things that you're probably aware of on Amazon leave you a little bit to be desired um, if they're working very well. As you know, a lot of the uh, rating systems there are fixed or loaded, so that can always, can't always be trusted. And then someone actually had a question to me, well, how do you know if your, your particular device is working correctly? Well, actually at this point, I can only go by the engineering spec sheets on the particular LEDs I'm working with and also some calculations. But until I actually either bring in some bacteria and look at it under a Microsoft, uh, Microsoft microscope to see actually how much of the uh, bacteria has died. But again, that's only bacteria. You know, I'd have to work with a, uh, a research center that is testing these type of things. And uh, again, disclaimer, um, these aren't tested. All I can do is provide you engineering references and for you to make your own decision. Um, and sadly, a lot of the type of devices right now do not seem to have certification of any form. Uh, so you're kind of up in the air. A lot of them just say, that, hey, they're 99% uh, killing germs. They're being used in a lot of different things. Um, but other than the research data that's out there already, I don't know of any device that actually has been tested, except in the medical, and we're talking thousands of dollars. All right, let's move on to this article here. So this is an interesting thing. It's using a full paper on using um, UV dosage and go through, it's fairly technical. I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of the things, but it identifies uh, essentially the units and then identifies how effective it was in killing multiple items here, including viruses, which is further down the list. Um, I didn't notice anything specifically COVID-19, but obviously um, the COVID actually has a different name, which is probably in here, and I just didn't spend the time to look for it. But you can go through this, and you can see uh, a lot of different things, and the lamp type that was utilized, and how much of a dosage which was provided, and the protocol that was performed and then obviously the results of the reaction to it. So uh, a fairly detailed um, table here that you can utilize uh, if you want to do research on a host of viruses, funguses, or fungi and uh, bacteria. Okay, and then here's another article. Again, all these will be in the show notes about the effectiveness from my readings, 
UVC lighting is very effective, uh, but the important thing is ensuring that the amount of dosage uh, is proper, which means you have to ensure that you get a not only the proper wavelength, but you also have to have the amount of energy at a particular distance in order at a, at a particular time in order to ensure that the virus or bacteria is killed. And this article does a good job of kind of talking about it, but it obviously is a little bit of a promotion to their own product where they're using it to clean the air in HVAC systems. And then uh, for you techies out there, I have a link on from Semiconductor Today that talks about how many UVC lamps or LEDs are going to be sold. Uh, it's funny, this was, um, when was this put out? Uh, in 2019. I'm pretty sure that they weren't aware of what's happening now and how this would affect uh, sales and production. I have a feeling that they're all going to go up. Here are some of the leading uh, LED manufacturers shown here in 2017 and then in 2018. That I thought was pretty interesting. Okay, I already looked at that article. And then for the you techie math whizzes out there, how to ca calculate the UV dose. And someone had that question and this was the best answer here. So, and I went through it, very nice. Just remember to scale, essentially the uh, standard equations are in meters, so you have to scale it to centimeters. And this person does a good job of doing that. And uh, one of the questions though is the person who asked it didn't provide the energy level or the distance, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it does say five centimeters and the wavelength, notice 365, 302, and 254. 365 seems to be, or I'm sorry, 265 seems about 260. It's, it, there's a range, um, is about what they recommend is UVC light. And uh, this person identifies what that uh, amount would need to be at five centimeters and what the energy level would be. So nice little paper if you wanted to do your own experimentation. So let's get down to, because we're a little bit past an hour, where can you get these things? Well, first place you can look is eBay. I mentioned Amazon. I bought a bulb from Amazon, but I, a little concerned it seemed to be already being priced a little higher than some of these other sites. Um, again, is eBay, excuse me, eBay reputable? Um, I think it's a roll of the dice. But the, the important thing is, the one that I want to show off right now is this new bulb, they call it 2020. They're using a new type of um, LED. And it's from a Taiwanese LED uh, manufacturer. And they're called corn husk balls. And what's cool about them, this one is made with um, aircraft grade aluminum. And a lot of the uh, bulbs of this style are done that way. And as mentioned, it's 60 watts. And if you read it, uh, and most of them seem to be consistent here, is, um, as they say, 30 times shiner. You can essentially, for 500 square feet, put it in the middle of a room for 30 minutes, and it basically will irritate the room. Um, again, I have not tested this. This is just what I'm reading. Um, but more importantly, if you're familiar with LED lighting, it, is, it generates less heat. Um, for the same amount of energy put out, as in this case, 60 watts. And um, that's always important. This particular one comes with a little remote control. And one thing that I have not identified with the UVC light is, and I think I mentioned it in the Facebook post, what makes this so lethal to virus and bacteria is because it kills the cellular structure of it, and it will also kill the cells in your own body. So anything like your skin, uh, it will kill plants, it will kill your animals. So one of the things that you'll see in all of these is make sure you're not in the room with it when you turn it on. 
which I don't know if this one has the image, but some of them have an image where you have this couple kind of relaxed and you have the bulb in the middle of the room, uh, which is kind of nutty. Obviously, you don't want to do that. So this would be a, a bulb that I have coming, and then I have a few more coming, including some LED strips. Again, it is the wavelength that's important, and, uh, and the number of bulbs, or in this case, the LEDs, uh, on the strip and in this case they all seem to be about 60 watts and they all look very similar so I have a feeling they're coming from the same manufacturer. I am hoping that I receive mine sooner than later but um, I don't know. And uh, so yeah as you can see there are several here. And so I will report back later on how well these bulbs work. Um, I'm have a feeling though that this one might be too hot for my little plastic container so I have another um, 15 watt version that's coming in and um, that one I will probably put in this here I'm also going to be getting a basically a metal container uh, which will help dissipate the heat better more importantly it won't melt it uh, and uh, that can be used I'm also thinking of this one has kind of a, a sloped bottom, but uh, so that way I could put um, a small amount of alcohol in it, and with the heat, it could vaporize and actually provide a vapor uh, alcohol along with the irradiation process. Now, I could also have the whole thing blow up in my face, so um, don't know if I'm going to do that, um, but I think it's an interesting idea. So here's one source, and then uh, here's a smaller version of that bulb. And again, what you're going to be looking for is an E27 base, which is for standard light bulbs, and they have some other types as well um, that you can see here. Also, if you're in the United States, you want to make sure you have one that matches 110 our voltage. If you're in Europe, make sure you go with uh, 220. And... Uh, because in some cases they'll work on both, but if it's made specifically for a particular voltage, you would either blow up, or in the case of if it's undervalued, um, you would get a weaker amount if it works at all. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, a lot of these bulbs will have the US flag and identify as 110. That's the one you want to get. And again, they tell you 99.99. Notice they added another 9 there from some of the research information and tells you what it will kill. Um, but the important thing is this one is, um, does it give you, yeah, see this one doesn't identify the wattage. So that's also something important. And also I don't think, okay, it doesn't identify the uh, the type of LED that's utilized, but this particular style of LED actually has a different wavelength, so that doesn't help you much. And so this one doesn't actually tell you, other than it's a germicidal bulb and UVC, but it doesn't actually tell you the wavelength. So something else that I have used a lot over the course of years, and again, it's up to you, is Alibaba. Um, they're great for buying large um, volumes of components. But here you can actually buy the actual LED themselves. So if you wanted to make your own system, um, you can do so. And the pricing is reasonable. And shipping seems to be reasonable or at least normal. Um, again, I don't know how well this would work off. But uh, the other thing is that they have um, ultraviolet at 254 nanometers. And they also show 365. You want to go with the 254. And uh, this would be utilized um, to replace my serpentine band in here at the proper wavelength. And um, they come in different sizes. And obviously you can buy a full strip of it. Like this one for 440 you can buy, I can't think it's like 100 meters or something. So if you wanted to make a lot of these, you can. And so again, just remember the wavelength, like this one here is 265 UVC. 
And then uh, if we go out to AliExpress, which is more of the consumer or what do you call it? smaller order sizes. Um, again, if you put in UVC, you'll see a lot of them. And this is, I bought a couple of these germicidal lamps here that are, let's see if this one identifies its wattage. Um, but notice they're all 220, which is not going to help me. Uh, so I had specifically put in uh, one for my for 110. So I'll type in UV. Let's see what comes up. All right, so here we go. This. So this one here, you can buy at 110 UVC. And then you need to go down and they actually have what they call a corn husk version LED as well. But I'm getting this because this is going to replace or on my new canister on top. And then obviously some more examples. Again, none of them have any medical certification. They just all identify, oh, this is what I was looking for. So here's your, your wavelengths. So infrared being on the low end, invisible, then red, and then as you go higher, the blue spectrum, then the ultraviolet. The UVA um, is what you see for black lights and so forth. But it's not until you get into the UVC um, that it's effective against um, viruses and medical. And as they identify here, make sure, make sure that you do not expose your eyes or skin to this. Um, I, I won't mention an individual who looks straight into an eclipse, um, but yeah, I would not do that. And here it tells you essentially you are breaking the knee. In, DNA bonds, which destroys uh, the cell or the DNA molecular structure of the virus itself. Kind of nasty from a molecular level. <laughs> Let's see if they have that image I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be just a magnifying glass. So how can you as an individual test this? So I've been thinking about that because someone asked me who's actually a scientist at one of the labs in Idaho uh, who has just retired said, well, how do I know that it's killing it? And that's a good question. Other than working with the specifics of the uh, engineering information, you won't know. So I live near a creek, um, so there's some standing water. I will get some bacteria, create a few petri dishes, some petri dishes, and um, look at the petri culture before and after and underneath the microscope and see. But again, that's specific to bacteria. Obviously, um, I could look at mold and a few other things, but I'm not going to have access. I'm hoping I don't have access to the actual virus itself. And normally, because it is smaller, I would probably not have the right equipment. So. Once I come up with something, I may just donate one to somebody who has access to it and maybe provide me more information on it. So as mentioned, the disclaimer here is if you're going to build something like this, you're only relying on the information engineering. So I wouldn't say it's faith only information, um, but you should probably spend a little time looking at things a little bit more. One other thing that I had forgotten that I'm going to go back to right now, I just remembered, is that when we were talking about mask, um, I will make a little folder um, in the cloud so that if you want to download this stuff. But this kind of tells you the efficiency for a filtering of different things. So if you were thinking of scarves or other things, you'll notice that the efficiency of a scarf versus the efficiency of a tea towel or a surgical mask, um, you see there's a substantial difference there. Um, what I found interesting, and my wife did too, is vacuum cleaner bags. And we had several that we just threw out because we had bought one of those um, shark vacuum cleaners that didn't require bags. And we had some, and I should have kept them. So you could cut those out and actually use those. And so it tells you 
and then also the pressure drop, which is important too, because clearly if you put something on your face that you can't actually get enough oxygen in, you could pass out. So there's some interesting numbers there too uh, to look at. Okay, so I think that's about it. I'm going to turn on my, uh, my, my little sanitation or device here. So I'm going to go plug it in somewhere. And I'll probably blow a circuit breaker. No. Okay. And sorry for dropping my microphone. All right, so I've got it plugged in. So as you can see, it provides a nice irradiated um, light source there. Um, it's about close to nine, 10 inches, almost a foot. Um, so if you wanted to put in large items, the bottom is actually raised a little bit. Um, so it actually works with these masks pretty well. You just drop it in and as mentioned with the top light, which I don't have on here, you just place it on top, which is going to be replaced with one of those uh, new lights coming in. And so the iridate from the top as well as from the sides, the only area that you're not finding any illumination is on the bottom. Um, if you noticed, I have wrapped this in an aluminum foil. That does two things. One, uh, it prevents light from escaping. As mentioned, uh, the light can be harmful to your eyes and your skin, so don't stick your head into it. Um, but also, it helps reflect it back into the device. And since this is a plastic container, um, from my understanding, uh, plastics are normally transparent to UV. Uh, keep that in mind because glass is not. And because of that, um, it should reflect it and um, ensure that all the radiation stays within this. That's why I placed a gap between each of these. I didn't really have to, uh, but I wanted to ensure that I distributed the LEDs all the way up the, the sides or the tube itself. So there you go. And uh, this cost about $40. So if you notice the pricing there, you spend $100 um, for essentially some piece of plastic that's unknown if it has enough uh, radiation. This one, uh, when I change these out with the proper UVC, and uh, should have more than enough um, irradiation capability to probably within 30 seconds sterilize. And what's neat about the 60 watt version, if it works as suggested, uh, you'll be able to utilize that bulb um, to sterilize an entire room if you wanted to. So, and again, I don't know the efficacy of it. Um, I guess we'll have to um, wait till some people do a little bit more research. As mentioned, I'm going to make one of these, donate it to a local uh, hospital here and let them do some testing on it and see what comes out of it. And if it looks um, useful, then uh, I will put it together some kit. But as you can see, it's not very hard to put together. I drilled a hole, um, filled it with silicone in order to make it uh, waterproof, and then basically took the 3M adhesive off and just snaked it all the way up to the top. Uh, this one has the ability, if you can see here, an open end so I could literally run another uh, set of uh, LEDs if I wanted to completely enclose it. Uh, and it does get a little warm, not hot, but I'm uh, concerned that if I use the 60 watt, uh, if a lot of that is dissipated inside of it instead of outside of it, um, that could be a problem. Also, the lid is plastic. Um, here I have it with a Bakelite type um, light. But, uh, or uh, what do you want to call it, uh, socket, 
that I drilled a hole into the hit lid, um, wrapped it in, I have this aluminum tape to keep it in place, and it seems to work really effectively. But if we are using a higher, like this is only 15 watts, if I use something um, of higher wattage than this, and there is a lot of heat here, uh, you probably do not want to go with a plastic lid. So I'm looking at um, kind of like a tin canister or something. Let me obviously tin, nothing's made of tin, but uh, like an aluminum can or something out of metal uh, that I'd be able to drill a hole into and use the same technique. I was thinking maybe a paint can uh, that normally goes to waste. So if you've got an old paint can, clean it out and uh, utilize that instead. And then you just, in, the, in fact, it's got a wider opening. It might be a little bit more useful, uh, again, with that bulb, which is about seven inches, uh, might be sitting too close to the actual object, uh, unless you get a taller can. Um, but if you use one of these little 15 watts like I have here, um, obviously it's only about two, two and a half inches uh, above the surface. So this might be really great for a paint can. So that might be my next trick. Uh, the only problem with a paint can is if you seal the lid, it may be difficult to get off. And so you Again, the only I, what you're wanting to do is just prevent this from having any light leak out of it uh, so that it doesn't affect you. Uh, the other thing I've been thinking about is if you've got an old um, uh, nail hardener, like my wife used to do her own nails, uh, so she's got one of those UV light things, you could essentially replace those bulbs with UVC and place your mask inside that little cavity uh, by using those um, UVC LED strips that I used in here. You just let, um, essentially glue those uh, to the top where the normal bulbs are at and then use that to irritate your object as well. So obviously there are a lot of uses for this. Um, as mentioned, I don't really know the efficacy um, of these particular devices yet and I will send one out and hopefully get more information on that. Or if somebody has already done that and wants to add to this, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I think that's about it. I have been rambling almost an hour and a half. I hope this was useful to you. Uh, as you can see, it's all pretty simple. Um, you can elaborate it, uh, use some type of control device. In fact, I've got something that can be controlled by Alexa to turn items on and off. So I could tell Alexa, zap my stuff, and then it would zap it. I don't know, come up with all kinds of unique things. Okay, that's... Uh, special edition. Uh, I might be doing this more often once I get done with my Apollo 11 VR project, which has consumed all of my time. But until then, stay safe. I guess I'm not going to be very safe because my mask here doesn't have its filter on. I guess I have to put it on. There we go. Plug it in. And then I can pretend to be Darth Vader. Use the force. Bye.